Okay. Add it all. And Okay, I think the students are in. We've got about 25. What time mm -hmm. are we at? I'll wait another minute or so. Okay. I'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Brent Helliker. I'm a professor in the biology department at Penn. Um, I will be giving you uh, today's guest lecture. And what I'll be talking about is how um, we can use stable isotope analyses to examine human and environmental linkages. And I'll start off very much talking about environmental linkages and how this and something that is very much um, based in plant biology and then how these plant processes and, and stable isotopes sort of trickle through to give us some idea about human and environment uh, linkages. Um, and so in the end, I think it'll be quite cool. We'll go from plant biology to forensics, which is interesting. Uh, but first, I should probably tell you a little bit about myself and the sort of research that I do in a very broad sense. Um, and also, I want to mention that at any point in here, feel free to plop a question into the chat uh, box. I'll be happy to stop and answer that as I go. Um, and uh, if, and I usually see them pop up. If I don't, um, bring my, try to bring my attention to it a bit more forcefully. But anyway, feel free yeah, I, to I, throw I, I can let you know about that. Okay, I can. I usually see them and get to them, but if I let one go too long, let me know. Um, okay, so um, I am a plant physiological ecologist. So I think about plant biology starting very much at a subcellular level. So thinking, you know, at uh, with enzymes in the chloroplast and how something like photosynthesis and water loss from plants scales from enzymatic levels up through to the leaf, to the region, and all the way up to the planet. And within this scaling, you know, I like to think of how things like weather variability so year-to-year -year, uh, variation in, in weather and how things like climate change affect plant physiology, plant ecology, where, you know, where certain or how certain plants deal with, say, a drought one year and an abundance of precipitation the next, and then how all of these local scale and really small-scale processes scale up to the planet. I also like to think, again, from a purely physiological perspective of, about how and why different plants grow where they grow. You know, what makes a, a, a plant successful in the tropics versus in a, a tropical savanna? How do plants deal with what we view as the really harsh desert conditions, where in some cases it may rain only once every 10 years, but we still see plant life there. How do they survive through that? Okay, so those are the sorts of research questions I like to think about. And stable isotopes are really cool in that they are very much affected, or they very much impart signals at this enzymatic level, at this small scale. And you can very much see those signals at the global scale. So with stable isotopes, you can trace these processes across a variety of scales. You can trace CO2 processes, but you can also trace water uh, uh, H2O processes because uh, with, C, with carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, they all have 
um, more than one stable isotope. Okay. So it all starts with this equation. And by it, in my biased view, I mean everything. Um, photosynthesis is what runs the world. And that's what we're representing by this equation. We have six, or we have CO2 and water leading to some energy rich carbon molecule and the release of free oxygen. So photosynthesis is of course performed by what we consider plants, but also a great number of microbes. Um, but interestingly, we shift that arrow in that direction and we get what you guys likely know as cellular respiration. Um, so plants respire, as do animals, as do microbes. But interestingly, we take that same equation and run it in this direction, and we get oxidation, so fossil fuel combustion. So when we think of large-scale carbon-based processes, the three big ones that are important to the planet right now photosynthesis, respiration, and fossil fuel combustion are all captured by this equation. And we can use stable isotopes to tell us something about how all these different processes are operating on a planetary level. Okay, so this, of course, is one of many iterations of a very famous figure that dominates a lot of scientific and, unfortunately, political discussion it's what's generally within the field, within my field, called the Keeling curve, because Charles Keeling is the person who first started making these measurements and discovered the rise in CO2. But we see the year-to-year -year increase of CO2 globally. Now, that is interesting, but what I find more interesting are these oscillations. So what do these oscillations represent? Any thoughts? Yep, seasonality. That's exactly right. So, hold on. My cursor is stuck. There we go. All right. So, when we see CO2 dropping from the atmosphere, that represents photosynthesis being predominant in the summer, and we see CO2 popping back up, that is respiration being predominant in the late fall, winter, and spring. So what this process, what we're seeing in this graph is everything I described in this equation, but on a global scale. Now on the global scale, this, these oscillations generally continue because, and so, you know, of course we have when the northern hemisphere has its summer, the southern hemisphere is having its winter. So you could argue, well, why would you see oscillations on a global scale? Well, the simple matter is we have much more land in the northern hemisphere. So we are seeing, and, and land is much more seasonal. Temperature changes much more dramatically than in on water. So you see much more seasonality on land than you do in the oceans. You have much more land in the northern hemisphere. So carbon dioxide oscillations are dominated by the seasonality of the Northern Hemisphere. Okay. Now plants, um, higher plants gain CO2 and lose water through these stomata, these small pores in the leaf. And when that CO2 enters um, the stomata, it diffuses into this intercellular airspace. I don't know if you guys realize this, but the leaf, any leaf you pick up can be as much as 30% air on the inside. So there is an immense amount of airspace that allows for the diffusion of this CO2 into all of these cells which contain chloroplasts to maximize photosynthesis. But having all of that um, airspace means a lot of water is lost from those cells and so plants also lose a lot of water out of those stomata. Right. Um, okay. So photosynthesis is just plant taking in carbon to make sugars, which are used to make more plant. And of course, eventually to reproduce the, 
which is, of course, the major point of it all, and to make seeds. Right. So all of these various processes I'm talking about, I've mentioned stable isotopes several times. What am I getting at here? Well, we're going to talk about several isotopes today. We're going to focus a bit on carbon and oxygen, and then we'll talk what you can do with measures of, say, stable nitrogen as well. And then using all three of them together to get this to get this bio indicator of various global processes, um, and uh, and definitely not just global processes as well. Oftentimes, very much small scale processes. Okay. Anyway, stable isotopes. Okay. When we look at the periodic table, we see carbon. We have this atomic mass, twelve, um, which suggests that it has six protons and six neutrons. But you see this number isn't exactly 12, which suggests that there are some isotopes of carbon, some other isotopes of carbon that might have more or, or have more or fewer neutrons. And so when we look at this, we, we, when we, sorry, when we look at carbon through our planet, through our solar system, we have two stable versions, or through the universe, rather. Um, we have carbon-12 and carbon-13. And as you might imagine, from this atomic mass, most of it is 12. And so on Earth, we have about 99% of all carbon is carbon-12. About 1% of all carbon is carbon-13. Um, and so when we look at atmospheric CO2, about 99% of it is carbon-12, and about 13, or about 1% of it is carbon-13. All right. So photosynthesis, that, that simple equation we looked at, which represents the process of photosynthesis, it discriminates against heavy CO2, or it discriminates against 13 CO2. Now that gives us some interesting information. So what happens here is that you have an abundance of 12 CO2 popping in or diffusing into the leaf, and you have, you know, that 1% of 13 CO2 diffusing in, but the 13 CO2 is discriminated against, as I mentioned. So that diffuses back out without being fixed by photosynthesis. So that process, so then photosynthesis is occurring in the chloroplast here, creating sugars that then are used to build more plant. And um, those sugars and the, and the plant that's built from that, those photosynthetic products has less 13C than that of the air. So when we measure the carbon isotope ratio of air, it is this minus eight per mil. And no need to worry really about what the numbers mean, just compare one versus the other. But when we look at the, thir the carbon isotope ratio of plants, we have this huge variation of about minus 14 to minus 35. So the carbon isotope ratio of plants are very distinct from that of the air in which CO2 is assimilated from. All right. Um, why negative? I knew the negative question was coming. Uh, it's... It's so carb, the carbon isotope ratio, the ratio of 13C to 12C of any material is reference to an international standard. And that standard was developed in, I believe, the 1940s uh, when this technology was just getting off the ground. And it, um, it, all the negative means is that Basically, everything we're measuring on the planet has less 13C than our internationally recognized standard. So the more negative it is, the less 13C it has. And um, that's that. Okay. Okay. Um, move that. So right, more negative equals less heavy isotope. 
Just covered that through a very timely chat question. Keep them coming if you'd like. Okay, so plants have less 13C than the atmosphere, which is exactly what these negative numbers mean. All right, so let's just take these simple facts. So we have these stable isotopes of carbon, 13C, 13CO2, 13 or 12C and 13C. Plants discriminate against 13CO2. They have less 13CO2 than the atmosphere. And just with that bit of information, we can look at what causes 13C to vary when we look at a host of plants? Because, you know, when I gave you that, that huge range, minus 14 to minus 35, is the range of, of carbon isotope ratios that we see in plants. So that means this is a lot of information in that range. Um, and so it varies by plant type. It can vary by plant response to climate. So if it has more 13C, it's what we call more water use efficient, or there's more carbon gain per water loss by that particular plant. And it also, 13C can also, or carbon isotop ratio can also vary by where plants are grown. Okay. So this general idea, particularly, so focusing here on this um, middle one here, that if you think about it, that means we can take a bunch of, of wheat varieties, for example, and plant them all out and give them a, you know, set up this large experiment where we're giving them more or less water. And we can just, by measuring the carbon isotope ratio of their leaves, we can determine which varieties are more water use efficient, which varieties are going to work better in a desert versus a very wet, um, a, a wet, more arable area. And so through carbon isotope, we have dramatically, we've been able to dramatically and quickly improve crop water use efficiency just by this simple measure. Okay. We can also look at carbon isotopes in tree rings. And so remember, or I'm sure you know, but tree rings represent a different year of growth every year. And we can look at the carbon isotope ratio of those tree rings and reconstruct the water use efficiency for that year, what type of uh, growth climate that year was. And so it becomes a pretty powerful tool to start reconstructing past climates. Um, and then there's the question of why the new money, which you guys may not realize we have new money. Okay, if we look at the $20 bill from the 1920s, and we look at the $20 bill from the 1980s. That's 60 years of not really a whole lot of change to the $20 bill. And then, and I noticed this when I was in college, all of a sudden, all of these 20s disappeared, just were pulled out of circulation, and these 20s started coming in. And now we get this 20, these $20 bills that have a lot more color in them. There's a lot more in the way of intricacies within the 20. And so why were we fine for 60 years? And then all of a sudden, all of our money changed to this, this, this money that was much, much harder to counterfeit. All right. So we couldn't figure out we, you know, so the government knew that there was a great deal of counterfeiting going on. And so that's what led them to shifting this 20 to this new 20 that is, that was much more difficult to counterfeit. But they couldn't figure out where it was from. And they actually, the counterfeits were so good that they couldn't determine which ones were counterfeits and which ones were not by all the standard mechanisms. And so what they did is they came to well, they came to, believe it or not, plant physiological ecologist and asked, is there any way we can figure this out? Because all the processing post, um, all the processing uh, post initial material, they couldn't really figure the counterfeits out. All right, so what is, you might have gotten a hint by me flipping prematurely to the Next slide, but what is our money made of? What are our bills made of? That's right, cotton. So our money is not paper, it's actually a fabric. 
and all of our um, cotton for our money is grown in one particular area in Texas. And it has a very distinct 13C signature. So when all these suspected counterfeits were pooled together and we start analyzing the carbon isotope ratio of them, we could determine that yes, in fact, they are counterfeits because they have, they don't match the carbon isotope ratio of all the rest of the, our money. But also we were able to place the growth of that cotton globally. And we found that the cotton was grown somewhere in Central Asia and that the processing was done, the, the actual creation of the bills was likely done in North Korea. And all of this could only really be determined by stabilized step analysis. And we never actually got, we were never actually told, and it wasn't made public, how much money the U.S. lost through these really good counterfeits, but it was a lot. Um, so yeah, so now we have new bills in place and we have fairly regular monitoring of carbon isotope ratio of bills in circulation. Right. So let's move to a different isotope for now. Um, let's go to oxygen isotopes where we have the similar argument. Um, oxygen actually has three stable isotopes. Oxygen 16, which you can look at the number and just guess that that's the most common. Oxygen 17 and oxygen 18. Now, isotopes, oxygen isotopes are a little bit different in that they're a wonderful proxy for temperature. Um, and so you could already think that, you know, if you're, if carbon isotopes give you some idea about plant response to its environment, and oxygen isotopes give you some idea about temperature, that if you were to use car measure carbon and oxygen of a plant, you would get that much more information. Okay, I am getting ahead of myself. All right. Okay, so oxygen 16 is 99.8% of all the oxygen on the planet, and I, oxygen 18, I, 16, oxygen 16 is 99.8, oxygen 18 is about 0.2% of all the oxygen on Earth. And this whole temperature thing. Okay, this is a beaker of water that's half full, has a lid on it. And the airspace above that water is going to come to 100% relative humidity. It's going to come to equilibrium with that liquid water here. And that vapor, the very act of evaporation of water leaving the liquid and going to the gaseous state, that discriminates against the heavy 18O. So you end up with more H2-18O in the liquid than you do in the vapor. Okay? And it's easy to think about that um, in, in terms of a simple thought process in that the H2-18O is a little bit heavier. It evaporates a little bit less readily. And so if we were, and so any, the vapor phase always tends to have less 18O than the liquid phase. And how much 18O is in this vapor phase is very much a function of temperature, a well established relationship with temperature. So in fact, we could look at liquid and if we had the isotope ratio of vapor and liquid in a system, we could actually reconstruct a pretty precise temperature. Um, all right. So that concept that how much 18O is in any sort of water substance has a relationship to temperature, that's some good information. And we can go out into the world and do something with that. Right. Namely, with ice cores. Okay, we have a lot of ice cores taken from Greenland, from Antarctica, and those ice cores are analogous to tree rings, that they form and lock out water and preserve the isotope ratio of that water. They trap, there are small air bubbles in these rings of ice, and so that traps, that, that 
Those air bubbles that are trapped give us an idea of CO2 concentrations in the past, give us an idea of pollutant concentrations in the past. Um, so there's a, an immense amount of information that's locked up in these, these rings of an ice core. And so just by measuring the changes in isotope ratio of that ice, of oxygen isotope ratio, we could do some, we could tell you something about global temperatures. So if you've ever seen something like this, and this is temperature reconstructions through 800,000, through the last 800,000 years. And so we go through, so these are glacial interglacial cycles. And so we have cold periods and we have warm periods. And for the last 800,000 years, that has cycled about every 100,000 years. We go from a glacial to an interglacial period. And we're obviously currently in an interglacial right now. And I mentioned that little bubbles of CO2 were trapped in those ice cores. Well, we can also use the various cores to reconstruct CO2 concentration and see and show that CO2 fluctuated with temperature uh, quite nicely throughout this whole period. All right. But this temperature anomaly, and so look at this. So this, so zero is where we are now. And this just gives you an idea of how much colder the earth was during these glacial maximum periods. You know, about almost 10 degrees Celsius cooler for global temperatures. That's a lot colder. All right. But this temperature anomaly isn't, you know, this isn't a measure of temperature. This is variation in oxygen isotopes of water that's trapped in those ice cores. And through that variation, we can reconstruct temperature. Now, this is direct ice core, but you can also do the same thing, and scientists have, all, have done the same thing, looking at ocean sediments and calcium carbonate shells that are trapped in these sediments. Well, the calcium carbonate is formed in the ocean water at a given temperature, and so you can do these same sorts of oxygen isotope reconstructions with calcium carbonate and do re temperature reconstructions that way as well and see if they match up to our ice core records, and they in fact do. So again, oxygen isotopes are a great measure of temperature. All right. Now, I've got a quick question. How do we know the approximate date of the bubble? Um, oh, God. I used to know the answer to that question. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I do not have an immediate. I used to know all of this stuff. I used to think about ice cores a lot more, but that was like 20 years ago. I don't. Um, I don't have an answer. I mean, yes, there's depth to the ice core, and you assume a certain, uh, you know, accretion rate by time, but I'm not quite sure how they get the exact dates. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay. Yeah, the, you can do some radioactive decay, but the, there's some... Uh, limitations for for time and some of that and this so that's suggesting using carbon carbon 14 um which of course is a non-stable isotope that we know the half-life quite well and so we can date um date things based on the amount of carbon 14 still in the material okay but i want to go back to this this concept of, of thinking of oxygen isotopes a bit and um thinking about temperature and condensation, evaporation, condensation, and the temperature during which evaporation and condensation occur. And that has a major effect on the oxygen isotope ratio. And what I'm showing you here is a regional distribution of oxygen isotope, of the oxygen isotope ratio in surface water across the United States. Now, the first thing that should jump out is that 
there is, and you'll just have to take my word for it, that these are huge differences, but these are huge differences. Comparing Florida to Idaho, there's this immensely strong isotope signal. But there's also a, a, a certain regionality to this in that you can give me a water source, you can give me a water sample, and I can measure its oxygen isotope ratio, and I can put it somewhere on this map. So that means if you're a tree growing up here versus a tree growing down here, the oxygen isotope ra ratio of the water that is taken up by the roots of that tree is very, very distinct. Okay. So, moving on to some eight, some more 18.0 stuff here. Um, so, 18.0 reflects, you know, I didn't mention this before, but it does reflect plant type to some extent. Um, but it's not nearly as strong as with carbon isotope ratios. Um, but it's mostly temperature and weather reflections. Um, and so, what's going on here? All right. So... You know, I mentioned here that in Florida versus Idaho, the isotope ratio of what comes in through the roots is, you know, like reflected. You can determine where a plant is grown based on the isotope ratio of um, water that's coming into its roots. But all of that... Um, that signal, that water signal that's coming into the tree, the oxygen, that is used metabolically in a sense, in that if you take plant cellulose, for example, or plant lignin, you know, the major components of wood, there's an immense amount of bound oxygen within that cellulose. And all of that oxygen, the isotope ratio of all of that oxygen is relatively equal to the isotope ratio of the water that's coming into the plant. So you can give me cellulose of a tree, and I can analyze the oxygen isotope ratio of that cellulose, and I can put it somewhere on this map. So there's actually a record of plant water source within the wood of a tree or the cellulose of a leaf of a tree. And so I can, you know, I can geolocate cellulose somewhere on this map just by measuring the oxygen isotope ratio. Okay, so thinking about this, a few years ago some scientists realized that when a big hurricane comes through, you get this big tropical hurricane coming through the south, and it leads to a huge inundation, you know, 12, 24 inches of water falling, in a very short amount of time that effectively forces all the old water out of the system. So you get a reset of the isotope ratio of the water available for plants to take up in a system. And the isotope ratio of those hurricanes, the water that comes in, is unique. It's slightly different from what we see in this regional map. And so they realized that they could look at tree rings through time and reconstruct hurricane frequency. All right, let me check the chat question here. Okay, that's some good just discussion between you guys, which is good. Um, okay, so what we have here, the black dots are documented cyclones, so documented tropical cyclones, tropical storms or hurricanes. And you can see that for most of them, there is a very clear shift in the oxygen isotope ratio of wood that's associated with these hurricanes. Now, that's really cool. I mean, you know, you've got trees that might be sitting there for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years. And within each tree ring, it's recording dramatic changes in the isotope ratio of water that's coming into that tree that associated with hurricanes. 
So you can actually reconstruct hurricane frequency well beyond the written record. And through this, you can start to get at pretty important questions like, has hurricane frequency increased as the world has gotten warmer, warmer through, uh, through global warming? And the good answer is no. It, we don't believe it has. We do believe that hurricanes are getting stronger, but we don't think frequency has increased. Um, okay. So you can use the oxygen mass step ratio in wood to reconstruct uh, hurricane frequency because hurricanes swap out um, or inundate the isotope ratio of standard of the normal water that's in the system. All right. Okay, so I want to get back to thinking about the sorts of things I think about a little bit more carefully. Now, um, sorry, a hawk just landed outside my window. That's very cool. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so we have, this is an image of a gargantuan redwood, right? Um, and that thing, you know, these can live for thousands of years. It's actually, what type of hawk? I don't know. It's, it's a small one. It, I would say it's actually more of a falcon, which is why I don't know what it is, why I'm excited, because we have a lot of red tail hawks around here, but I've not seen this one before. Um, okay. Uh, right. Plants, not animals. Um, this uh, this is a redwood, and it's sitting in the same position for you know thousands of years, and it really it really typifies a major problem with being a plant. Um, you can't move, so you've got to sit there and deal with first of all your climate, which is you know your average condition year to year, but also variations in weather, which are just, you know, variation upon climate. So year-to-year -year droughts, year-to-year -year, um, uh, periods of excessive rain, um, the odd cold year, the odd really hot year. And even think about it in terms of a climate sense. You know, trees receive an immense amount of incoming solar radiation. They have to. They need sunlight to do photosynthesis. But there's really a pretty small percentage of that incoming shortwave solar radiation that they use for photosynthesis. The rest of it leads to a lot of heating up. You know, animals can go run for shade. They can run into burrows. Plants can't do that. And so thinking about plant canopy temperatures, what do you, how do you deal with all of that incoming radiation? How do you not overheat? Um, and it's a really interesting question just in terms of plant evolution, but it's also an important question thinking about climate change and as things get warmer in a given region, how will plants continue to photosynthesize effectively? Um, what temperatures are too hot? And so thinking about all of this, we went back to stable isotopes particularly stable oxygen isotopes, and thinking about, well, you know, what is the temperature of a plant canopy in a given climate? Um, do they tend to match air temperatures? Um, do they, you know, does a, does a tree in the boreal forest do photosynthesis, do most of its photosynthesis as the, uh, at the same temperature as a tree in Florida? We don't really know. You know, measuring the temperature of an entire tree canopy over a long period of time isn't that easy easy to do. And but then also measuring how much photosynthesis it's doing at a given temperature it gets even harder. So okay, we have our leaf here with stomata open, and CO2 is diffusing in for photosynthesis, and water is being lost. Well, just like in our example with the beaker. H2-16O is preferentially lost. 
And so the water remaining in the leaf becomes enriched in H2A10O. Okay, we have photosynthesis going on. We're making sucrose. That sucrose is being exported to make tree rings. And all of those processes leads to a label of that leaf water isotope onto first the triose phosphates, then the sucrose, and that label of enriched water in the leaf is locked in to tree ring cellulose. So what I'm saying here is, you know, I already talked to you about the example of a tree ring cellulose having some, having a record of the water coming up through the base of the tree, and it does. But there's variation in the oxygen isotope ratio on top of that that has everything to do with this enrichment process in the leaf. And we had the simple thought that, well, is there a temperature record of the plant canopy itself here? And that would be a temperature record that is necessarily weighted by photosynthesis because it's the actual process of photosynthesis that's locking in that isotope ratio that's governed by temperature of the plant canopy. Okay. So again, we have this regional distribution of water. We wanted to look at this across a lot of sites, and we looked to see if we could reconstruct plant canopy temperatures from 39 different tree species going from uh, the tropical, the montane tropical forest in Puerto Rico up the eastern seaboard well into the boreal forest in northern Canada. So covering 50 degrees of latitude, 25 different sites, 39 different tree species. And so we're going, we're going across several biomes as well. We're going tropics, uh, warm temperate deciduous, cool temperate deciduous, and then two um, boreal sites, or actually three boreal sites. So we're really look, we're looking at a, at a lot of trees across a lot of different biomes. And what we found when we reconstructed these canopy temperatures was something quite interesting. That you get to these temperate sites, these warm temperate sites, and okay, sorry, I should explain this a bit more carefully. This is leaf, this is our calculated leaf temperature using oxygen isotopes minus growing season temperature. And, you know, you're a little bit, leaves are a little bit cooler than ambient temperatures in warm temperate systems, tend to match temperatures pretty well in the tropics. But then when you get to these colder and colder sites, you get this big difference between ambient air temperatures and leaf temperatures. It almost looks like leaves are warming up in cooler and cooler environments. And you know, you look at these mean annual temperatures, those are some cold mean annual temperatures. Now that doesn't mean the growing season is anywhere near minus 10 degrees Celsius. The growing season can actually get reasonably warm, but still we're looking at leaf temperatures minus growing season temperatures and the leaves appear to be quite warm when most photosynthesis is occurring. Now this is again, just leaf temperature relative to ambient growing season temperatures. When we look at just the leaf temperatures themselves, we see something quite astonishing. That these 39 different tree species 50 degrees of latitude, the temperature, the canopy temperatures at which most photosynthesis occurs is in this pretty narrow band with a mean of about 21 degrees Celsius across sites. So it looks as if, even across these disparate biomes, that trees are more or less settling in to some sort of optimal temperature range for photosynthesis. So what's going on? What do these temperatures mean? Well, they certainly do not mean constant leaf temperatures, that the tree canopy is somehow endothermic. That is absolutely not what's happening. Um, tree canopies must change with the weather, but they can do, they must change with, with seasonality with any given climate. But there are little tricks to be played on top of that that could lead to sort of the sort of relationship that we see.
Okay. It could mean that when photosynthesis occurs, it's during similar ambient temperatures. So, for example, it, it could mean that um, there is less photosynthesis occurring at, during the hottest part of the day in these warmer environments, and more photosynthesis occurs relatively more in the warmest part of the day in the boreal forest. So it's almost, you could think of this as sort of a behavioral shift of when photosynthesis is occurring, and most of it is occurring near these optimal temperatures across biomes. Or it could be something really interesting, like there actually is some sort of trend towards homeostasis. So leaf temperatures are actually warmer in ambient colder environments, and they're actually cooler in warmer environments. So how would they get cooler in warmer environments? Well, that very act of losing water when you're assimilating CO2 does, in fact, cool the leaf off, much like uh, perspiration cools us off. It takes a lot of energy to evaporate water, and that energy is taken from the substrate that's losing the water so it can cool the leaf off quite dramatically. But the interesting thing is, you know, leaf temperature is being warmer in colder environments. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, so let's, we're going to focus on these temperature deviations right now. Okay, so first, the behavioral aspect. If this is total solar radiation coming in, so in terms of doing photosynthesis, that's your peak incoming irradi irradiance. Um, but of course, on a daily or a seasonal time scale, there's a temperature lag. So we get, you know, if you think of this seasonally, we get most of our radiation in June 21st, but July is our hottest month. We get most of our radiation coming in around noon, but it's usually hottest in the day around two or three. So there's this air temperature lag, that, this temperature lag that lags incoming radiation. Well, what we see in a lot of places, particularly in hot environments like say, the southeastern United States, you see a photosynthesis profile that looks like this. That even though you have an immense amount of solar radiation coming in here, photosynthesis actually drops dramatically. And so it totally avoids this hot part of the day. And you can see different profiles when you go to, to, say, boreal forest, where you're actually at peak photosynthesis at the warmest part of the day. So there is this behavioral component that is behind the, the invariance of temperature we see. But when you get to colder systems, you get something else going on, too, that's really cool. Uh, well, actually really warm, in that... The needles on these trees, and the boreal forest is dominated by needle leaf species, coniferous species, and the needles actually get closer together. They get smaller and closer together. And what that does is it increases the boundary layer to dissipate heat loss from the plant. And so I get like the classic way I think I have people think about this is think of being in a cold, cold winter, and what's warmer, a mitten or a glove? Now, it's clear that a mitten is warmer because what you're doing is creating a much larger boundary layer. The heat is whipped away quite efficiently from your fingers if you're wearing a glove, but if you've got them stuck together like this, you have this much larger boundary layer, and heat is whipped away much less efficiently. Well, the similar thing is happening with these needle leaf species in the boreal forest. Their leaves are packed together and increases a larger boundary layer. And so that incoming radiation from the sun is both driving photosynthesis, but also heating the branch up. And you can see here, this figure is just showing the more needles you have packed per stem in both calm and windy conditions leads to a greater and greater temperature above ambient. Okay. So the answer here is that both of these are probably right, that you have both this, if you will, behavioral response, but you also have 
this biophysical response that leads to leaves being warmer than, in, than ambient temperatures in cooler environments. Okay, so let's think about more isotopes. So this is our, you know, we started off, or we, we saw this near the beginning of the talk, thinking about CO2 concentrations. We talked about the rise, and we talked about the oscillations being photosynthesis and respiration. And that this whole figure could be summed up by that simple equation. Well, every component of this equation has a distinct isotope ratio. Now that's really quite cool. So we look at the oxygen isotope ratio on the y-axis, carbon isotope ratio on the x-axis, and photosynthesis falls out. Respiration falls out. Combustion of gasoline falls out, as does natural gas. So everything, all the processes encapsulated by this figure have a distinct isotope ratio. We can do some pretty cool stuff with that because globally we have this huge network of continuous measurements of carbon dioxide and all the isotope ratios of carbon dioxide. And, you know, we can show these maps where we have CO2. We could have, a, a, you know, a global rug of CO2 where we have strong oscillations in the north, smaller oscillations in the southern hemisphere. You see the general increase in CO2. And we also have isotope measurements of those. Right. So... We think that prior to the Industrial Revolution, on a global basis, photosynthesis and respiration were approximately balanced. That you would still see these strong oscillations, but there would be no continuous increase of CO2. And you would, of course, have years, which we see now, like you have a big El Nino year, tends to lead to greater respiration globally. They have La Nina years, you tend to see more photosynthesis globally. And so these would definitely be out of balance, you know, from one year to the next. But in general, we feel that photosynthesis and respiration were approximately balanced. But, of course, starting with the Industrial Revolution, we start burning a lot of fossil fuels, and that added CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, there was an argument a really strong argument about 20 to 30 years ago that that increase in atmospheric CO2 was not due to fossil fuels, that we weren't burning enough fossil fuels to actually lead to this observed increase in CO2. The argument that what it was volcanic, that it was increased volcanic activity that we didn't know about, um, you know, that, that there were small fissures in the mantle somewhere and a lot of CO2 was coming out. And, you know, that argument wasn't totally insane because that is how CO2 is returned back to the atmospheres through volcanic activity. But it was shown very, very clearly because of distinct isotope signatures that the increase in atmospheric CO2 is in almost entirely due to the burning of fossil fuels because of the distinct isotope ratios. But it's more important than that in that we could show that half of all the fossil fuel released since the Industrial Revolution is not, did not lead to an atmospheric increase. It actually was taken up by plants and stored in the biosphere. So the increase of CO2, so our CO2 increases about four parts per million every year because of fossil fuel release. If not for plants assimilating and storing this carbon, it would be assimilating at about 8 ppm every year. So all of the CO2 increase we've seen has actually is actually much, much less than it could have been if photosynthesis has not, was not stimulated. And again, we know this because, by analyzing the stable isotopes of CO2 
on global scales. And we're actually analyzing it very much on a leaf and an enzymatic scale and then looking at these global observations and seeing how those enzymatic processes scale to measurements at the globe. And we could deconvolute all of this stuff and, you know, determine exactly what I've written here. That fossil fuels, um, that half of our CO2 is being that we're releasing through fossil fuels is being assimilated and stored in the biosphere. Okay. Um, and again, these approaches are active, actively ongoing to actually develop carbon budgets. Um, at, at, you know, I mentioned the scale of cities. That is true, but also, you know, country scale, continental scale, and of course, global scale. All right. We can also use measurements of more than one isotope to get a feel for food adulteration, geolocation of drugs, determining where a bomb was made from and where the materials where bombs were made from. Uh, we, could, we can sort out um, origination of bioterrorism and look at things like animal migrations. Um, Okay, food adulteration is an interesting one, and a really simple one to think about is honey, which I never realized until I started thinking about carbon isotopes a lot. But fake honey is a big deal, apparently, um, that a lot of people will use the abundant and cheap corn sugar to make a basically a fake honey and sell it as honey. And you can very quickly determine if you're dealing with a real honey versus a fake honey by just looking at the carbon isotope ratio because the corn sugar or corn or cane sugar have a different photosynthetic pathway than most of the, the, um, the, the pollen that's going into make, making honey. And so you can easily determine if you've, you know, if someone has either created a fake honey or doped a honey to make a current source go farther with um, a cane sugar or a corn sugar. Okay, so drugs. Um, when I was in grad school, we had scientists um, from the DEA, chemists from the DEA come into the lab, and there was a safe somewhere on campus where I was never allowed to know its location that was full of cocaine and heroin. And the, the idea was to use stable isotopes, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen isotopes, to determine the location of cocaine growth throughout, and, and heroin product growth and poppy growth and heroin production throughout the world. And this is just a graph showing you that, you know, pretty clearly we can determine not just country, but we can actually determine which valley within a country cocaine is grown. So it's really quite cool. Used to be a big deal about tracking marijuana as well, but that's slowly becoming legal everywhere. So that's less, less of an issue. Um, okay, so now, plants and animals. Okay, so C3 and C4, two different photosynthetic pathways. That's all you really need to know. C, you know sugar cane and corn are both C4, so we as Americans have a you know, great component, or those of us who live in North America have a great component of C4 plant in our diet. But the important thing to look at this plant part is that there's no overlap. That I can take the leaf of any plant, analyze its carbon isotope ratio, and tell you what photosynthetic what photosynthetic pathway it uses. Is it a C3 photosynthetic pathway plant or is it C4? Now the important thing is that any animal that eats those has this fractionation. There's discrimination against heavy isotopes. So there's this animal offset, but C3 and C4 remain distinct. And, you know, you have reflections here of a mixed C3, C4 diet. But if you eat only C3 or if you eat only C4, that means I can measure any part of you, your hair, your teeth, your bones, your blood, your tooth enamel, 
and I can reconstruct aspects of your diet just by looking at carbon isotope ratios. Okay. So in terms of stable isotopes, you very much are what you eat. Okay. So these two guys are athletes. We have Floyd Landis and Justin Gatlin. Justin Gatlin's made a comeback, but both of them had major, major setbacks because they got busted doing drugs, performance-enhancing drugs. Uh, both of them, namely, were doing uh, synthetic testosterone to improve their performance. Now here, and I'll explain to you how this dietary offset helps us determine through stable isotopes how that they were, in fact, cheaters. All right, so I have a super old photo here. Ryan Howard's now an old man, but we're going to assume that he wasn't taking drugs. But So he eats his spinach, has a carbon isotope ratio of minus 30, and he has a dietary shift, a metabolic shift, that leads to his body being, say, minus 26 instead of minus 30. So that the testosterone he makes is also minus 26. Well, soybean has, is loaded with phytohormones that are actually quite close to our hormones. And within a lab, you can take uh, proge a progesterone, a phytoprogesterone, and quite easily convert it to, to testosterone. But the problem is you don't have that metabolic shift. So if the isotope ratio of soybean is minus 30, then the testosterone that is synthesized from that also has an isotope ratio of minus 30, and that is very quickly picked up by the cheaters, or by a blood analysis of the cheaters. And so that is, in fact, how both these guys got busted. Landis lost, you know, won, won the Tour de France and then quickly lost it after looking at the carbon isotope ratio of his, uh, his testosterone, and Landis and uh, Gatlin was banned from uh, track and field for quite a few years because of his positive test. All right. Let's go on with these dietary shifts a bit more. When we look at carbon isotope ratio versus nitrogen isotope ratio of primary producers, primary consumers, and then predators, we see this enrichment going up with trophic level. So you see an increase in nitrogen, of heavy nitrogen in 15, and an increase in carbon-13. So you are what you eat, plus or minus a few per mil. All right, so this is a bunch of college students. We have Can there be naturally occurring higher testosterone? Absolutely, there can be naturally occurring higher testosterone, but it's even if it's higher, it's still going to have that isotopic offset. If you produce it, you're still it's going to look different than synthetic testosterone. So it's not about how high the testosterone is; it's about the isotope ratio of the testosterone. Okay, so we have carbon and nitrogen isotope ratio of students in an undergrad class. And we have, they're all self-reporting. You have omnivores, vegetarians. We have one vegan. And so look at that. Look at that versus that. So you have all these students with their chosen diets and isotopically, I believe this was all done on their hair. They follow along that trophic, the, the isotope, what we'd expect of isotopes determining a certain trophic level. So that's really cool. We can look at multi-isotope analyses of your hair and get some idea about your diet. Now this one is kind of fun. We have undergrads at University of Santa Barbara, University of California, Santa Barbara, and undergrads at University of Michigan. And before we get into that, I'm going to ask all of you a question. 
University of California, Santa Barbara versus University of Michigan. Who's eating more meat? Who's up in this region? Every year it's the same. So who's going to look more like meat eaters? The Michigan, and pretty much everyone, you know, has this assumption of Midwest meat eaters, and most people say Michigan from year to year. But what we find is that it's actually the Californians that are higher on the trophic level, that appear to be eating much more meat than students in Michigan. Now, of course, we have all sorts of you know biases going into that interpretation, but what it what it turns out is that it seems that when all of these students were analyzed in terms of like you know what their general dietary intake was was that the the u c s b students were eating a heck of a lot more fish, particularly marine fish. And marine trophic cascades are very big and complex, and so they actually are a bit more extended, and so the protein, the enrichment within those multi-trophic levels of marine systems actually put them much higher on the scale than the students at Michigan, who were, in fact, your biases were correct, were eating more meat. It's just UCSB were eating more fish. So that's quite interesting. All right. So back to this regional distribution of water. And we've, you know, we've talked about these isotopes being the isotopes of what we eat being stored in us. Well, the isotopes of what we drink are also very much stored in us. So if oxygen, the oxygen isotopes in plant water gets lodged in the cellulose that plants synthesize, well, your organically bound oxygen in your body comes from the water that you consume. So I can tell you by analyzing your hair if you come from Idaho versus Florida. So we look at the oxygen isotope ratio of drinking water and that of tooth carbonate. So the record is in your teeth. This is the oxygen isotope ratio of hair and the oxygen isotope ratio of tap water. Very strong correlation. So I, I was not involved in this work at all. Uh, I have several good colleagues that were, and they collected this data by driving, doing a cross-United States trip, stopping at barber shops all along the way, and getting a sample of tap water from the barber shop and collecting hair from the floor, which... It's <laughs> an interesting way to gather data. Um, so, right, oxygen isotope ratio of hair correlates very well with local tap water. This is a colleague who, this is in sing, a single piece of hair, was in Beijing, and then moved to Salt Lake City, Utah. So we have, of course, hydrogen and oxygen in water, and both of those have isotopes. And so you can see that move locked into the hair, and then as the hair grows, the water source changes, so the isotope ratios of the hair change. Pretty cool. Right. This one is also cool, but a little bit sad. This was a cold case, a Jane Doe that was found in Utah, uh, very much decomposed, and what was left was a hair sample. And along that hair, this is both now the carbon isotope ratio of that hair and the oxygen isotope ratio of that hair. And you can see very distinct what are called isoregions along the length of these hairs. And you can plot those isotope, those isoregions onto a broader map. So she was discovered in region one, 
and we have region two. Up, well, I'll come back to that. So we have these three different regions. And through these movements and through these suggested movements based on the isotope ratio of hair and through combing through missing persons reports that match movement within a one to two year period for people moving around, they were able to actually establish that this woman was from the Pacific Northwest and that she had moved around the Intermountain West for, uh, for matching these two moves or these other moves. And they were able to determine who she was and they never determined who killed her, but they were able to give her family some closure. So depending on your perspective, that's either a terrible story or at the end of the day, something that at least gave her family some semblance of comfort. Uh, no, she was not found in Yellowstone. She was actually found just outside Salt Lake City. Um, okay. So this is where we started out more or less, how we get from pretty basic questions about plants and some thinking about some interesting chemistry with carbon isotopes. And we move to, um, figuring out some interesting things. Half of all of our fossil fuel release um, has been assimilated by photosynthesis. But we were able to show you how we have caught cheaters. Now, the interesting thing about this cheating story is that the technology I told you, not, I told you about is largely out of date because the moment all of these professional athletes that do use performance enhancing drugs, the moment they get caught, the game is on for a new way to cheat and they will never do the old way again. Um, we can geolocate your past movements by simply taking a strand of your hair. Um, we know where you're getting your drugs and that's it. Uh, thanks for listening guys. And, um, have a great Wednesday.